One, a patient has undergone an open cholecystectomy. Which instruction should the nurse include in the discharge teaching? One, empty the bio bag daily. Two, breathe deeply when nauseated. Three, keep adhesive dressings in place for four weeks. Four, report biocolor drainage from any incision. The answer is report biocolor drainage from any incision. What is a laparoscopic cholecystectomy? This term cholecystectomy refers to the gallbladder. Remember the location of the gallbladder. So the gallbladder is in the right upper quadrant. It's very close to the liver. In the past was done open, meaning the abdominal wall would be open through an incision located approximately right here. So fairly decent size incision, and then the gallbladder would be removed. Because the incision is fairly large, patients would stay in the hospital for a few days and then be discharged. But it was one of the more painful incisions, but patients would generally recover over a week, two weeks, three weeks. Now that procedure is done laparoscopically. And so the laparoscopic procedure means that typically there will be a very tiny incision near the umbilicus, which will allow for the insertion of a scope. And that scope has a camera, and that camera allows you to look at the gallbladder. These incisions are very small. The instruments can be inserted through these very small incisions, and then the gallbladder is removed. So now instead of having this one big incision, we have these small incisions. In many cases, the same day operation, meaning the patient can go home at the end of the day if their surgery is done early or the next morning. The pain postoperatively is much less. The only place the, the bile would come from, if you saw bile color drainage, would be from the gallbladder. And we don't ever expect to see that. So that's why the, the correct answer here is you would need to report that. But that is what you need to know about that procedure because typically they will ask you questions either they will refer to it as a laparoscopic cholecystectomy or they will refer to it as an open cholecystectomy, which means that the patient's going to have a larger incision. Two, a 32 year old female hospitalized with acute cholecystitis has severe pain. Which prescription will be most effective in relieving the pain? One, infusing LR, lactated ringer solution, at 80 cc's per hour. Two, administering morphine, 5 to 10 milligrams IV PRN every three to four hours. Three, changing the patient's wound dressing. Four, having a nasogastric tube inserted for decompression. The correct answer is two, administering morphine, 5 to 10 milligrams IV PRN every three to four hours. So this is a question that's a tough one because you have not been on the ward treating or managing these patients postoperatively. That is what these questions are very good at teaching you. You will potentially see questions like this on the HESI exit and on the NCLEX, as a matter of fact. You should know that whenever you have an, a surgical procedure, especially when they use a keyword like severe. And if they use a term like severe or they tell you the patient is immediate post-op, either one of those would warrant giving a medication like morphine. The other time that you give morphine is with MI. It is one of the medications of choice, right? So it's part of that MONA acronym that we use. The M is for morphine. So we, it's not that we can only give morphine after surgery. We can also give it for some of these surgical conditions where patients have severe pain. So how do you know whether or not you are dealing with one of those conditions? Well, you pick it up through doing questions, but the primary ones are going to be acute cholecystitis, MI, as we talked about. Any description where they tell you the pain is severe, that's a strategic word, which is allowing you to give a strong pain medication. Morphine would be acceptable, they typically will not quiz you on the dose, so you don't have to worry about so much about the 10 milligrams because that's not part of this examination, but they do want you to recognize that morphine would be acceptable in this situation and every three to four hours would be fine. These patients typically would be MPO because when they eat, they have pain and they are usually pre-op if they're being admitted. So they are MPO, meaning nothing by mouth. So we wouldn't give these patients like an oral tablet pain medication typically. We would give them something IM or even IV. And morphine would be perfectly acceptable for that. All of the other choices here would not address the, the question, which is the most effective for relieving pain. You see, so they want you to connect that as well. Saline may be giving, given to this patient, but it will not provide pain relief. Um, remaining MPO may be beneficial, 
but it's not going to relieve pain. And nasogastric suction, which we would use for nausea, will not relieve pain. So the only acceptable answer here is the morphine administration. You'll be able to tell the difference. You know, if they give you a sprain or they give you a relatively mild condition where you typically could get pain relief by an oral medication or an NSAID, that's when you would administer it. But if they use a word like severe, they're telling you, you have to address that. And if you don't address it in the question, then you're likely to miss that question. They're really not trying to trip you up with giving an opiate because there are definitely indications for giving opiates that you will see when you get into the clinical. Four, a 54-year-old male presents complaining of abdominal pain and clay-colored stools. What additional information should the nurse obtain from the patient? Select all that apply. One, fatty food intolerance. Two, fever. Three, jaundice. Four, flank echimosis. Five, jar sign. Six, bleeding esophageal varices. The correct answer is one, fatty food intolerance, two, fever, and three, jaundice. What are they trying to tell me when they say this patient has pale colored stools? They're really telling you that these, this patient is having biliary obstruction. Sometimes it may be described as clay colored. I, I want you to remember, think of it this way. You don't even have to memorize this one once you can make sense of, so here's our gallbladder. And remember that the gallbladder has bile and the bile is green. Why does the body make bile? The bile is very good at aiding in digestion. So when there is a meal, the bile would be released from the gallbladder, digestive or into the intestinal tract. The gallbladder has the ability to contract. The bile is green. Now, when there is obstruction to, to the release of bile into the intestine, now this color is not mixing with the normal intestinal contents, the food that you eat. And then as it passes through the colon and water is removed, the stool becomes a very dark brown like we typically see with stool. If you have biliary obstruction, and how could you potentially get biliary obstruction? Well, if you had a stone in the gallbladder or multiple stones with gallstones, you can have one of these stones that will pass and block, or it may even block the common bile duct. And so if you have a blockage in a gallbladder cystic duct or in the common bile duct, now the bile is not being released into the GI tract. And so now instead of your stool being dark brown, the stool is either clay colored or gray. So what else is associated with biliary obstruction besides gray colored stools? Well, it's an obstruction. It will back up and it will result in pain here in the right upper quadrant. If because the bile is important for digesting fats, then we have intolerance to fatty foods. Because it's a blockage, we're going to have fever and inflammation. And because now you have a backup of the bile, which is going to be released into the circulation, we, you're going to see jaundice or that yellowing of the skin. Notice that these others are just distractors. There's really no respiratory distress associated with it. McBurney's point is in the right lower quadrant, and this is pathology, which is in the right upper quadrant. There's no ulcer associated with it. And, and what is McBurney's point? McBurney's point is the point of pain in patients who have acute appendicitis. Five, a 63-year-old male hospitalized who has been scheduled to have a cholecystectomy expresses anxiety about having surgery. Which nursing intervention would be the most appropriate to achieve the outcome of reducing anxiety? One, providing the patient with information about what to expect. Two, telling the patient not to be anxious. Three, reassuring the patient by saying that the surgery is uncomplicated. Four, contacting the healthcare provider? The correct answer is one, providing the patient with information about what to expect. If, think about yourself. If you have a major exam coming up, what do you most want to know about the exam? What's going to relieve your anxiety about the exam mostly? Knowing what's on it, right? Or another way of saying that is knowing what to expect. Six, an 82-year-old female is post-operative day one after an open cholecystectomy with bile duct exploration. Following surgery, the patient has a T-tube. What should the nurse do to determine the effectiveness of the T-tube? One, irrigate the tube to ensure that it is patent. 
two, unclamp the T tube, three, assess the color and amount of drainage every shift, four, connect the T tube to low wall suction. The correct answer is three, assess the color and amount of drainage every shift. What is our rule of about tubes, NG tubes, T tubes, chest tubes, mediastinal tubes, irrigating, unclamping, pulling. This is not a feeding tube. This is not a tube where you are administering food. And on this exam, do you see any selection where you are offered to either clamp, remove, irrigate? Don't do that. Don't manipulate tubes on this exam. It is not going to be the correct answer. For this exam, you are going to monitor or you're going to call the healthcare provider. One, you need an order. Um, it's not that you will never do it, but it will be after you've been instructed on how to do it. You don't expect to ever have bile drainage from an incision. Right. Okay. So if you have a T-tube in place, you should not expect drainage from the incision, not bile drainage from the incision. A patient is admitted to the hospital with suspected gastroesophageal reflux disease. What is the examination of choice for evaluating gastroesophageal reflux disease and gastric ulcers. A, chest x-ray, B, colostomy, C, upper GI with contrast, D, upper endoscopy. The correct answer is D, upper endoscopy. Explanation, esophageal gastroduodenostomy, EGD, is a procedure that uses a long scope with a light at the tip inserted through the mouth to inspect the esophagus, stomach, and duodenum. Biopsy can also be done with an EGD scope. The unlicensed assistant personnel, UAP, asked the nurse about risk factors for gastroesophageal reflux disease. GERD. What foods should be avoided in patients with GERD? Select all that apply. A, caffeine. B, chocolate. C, peppermint, D, alcoholic beverages. The correct answer is A, caffeine, B, chocolate, C, peppermint, and D, alcoholic beverages. Explanation. Patients with gastroesophageal reflux disease are cautioned to avoid or eat certain foods sparingly that may worsen symptoms. These include A, B, C, and D. Some healthcare providers also counsel that fried foods and high fat foods should be avoided. A patient is admitted to the hospital with heartburn. What is the upper gastrointestinal series used to examine? Select all that apply. A, esophagus, B, pancreas, C, stomach, D, duodenum. The correct answer is A, esophagus, C, stomach, and D, duodenum. Explanation. Upper GI series involves drinking a barium mixture and an x-ray to see the esophagus, stomach, and duodenum. It is not the preferred study to evaluate GERD, but it still has a role in some cases for evaluation. When combined with a small bowel follow-through, it may be used to examine the small intestine. Which of the following can be performed by an unlicensed assistive personnel, or UAP? Select all that apply. A, assessment of drainage. B, skin care. C, location and assessment of pain. D, oral care. The correct answer is B, skin care, and D, oral care. Explanation. Unlicensed assistive personnel provide valuable patient care. Their responsibilities include documenting and reporting, assisting with rehabilitative tasks, taking and recording vital signs, and observing patient activities. What two postoperative complications occur after meals in patients who have undergone gastric surgery? Select all that apply. A, postprandial hypoglycemia, B, postprandial hyperglycemia, C, diabetes insipidus, D, dumping. The correct answer is A, 
postprandial hypoglycemia, and D, dumping. Explanation. Surgical procedures that involve gastric resection, removal of a portion of the stomach, and reconnection of the stomach to the small intestine may lead to postprandial low blood sugar and dumping. Symptoms include sweating, palpitations, abdominal pain, and diarrhea. The nurse is caring for a patient in the intensive care unit, ICU. What is the best way to provide oral care to patients who cannot perform self-oral care? A, flossing the patient's teeth after each meal. B, rinsing the patient's mouth with mouthwash. C, after every meal, a soft toothbrush should be used to brush the teeth. D, a toothbrush may be used to brush the teeth in the morning and before bed. The correct answer is C. After every meal, a soft toothbrush should be used to brush the teeth. Explanation. Patients in the intensive care unit and patients who cannot provide self-care require good oral care. The teeth should be brushed after every meal to maintain the dentition and gum health. An unexpected elevation in temperature. 102 degrees after an intestinal endoscopic procedure, such as an EGD, should prompt the nurse to select all that apply. A, suspect perforation. B, assess the patient. C, document the finding in the record only. D, contact the healthcare provider. The correct answer is A, suspect perforation. B, assess the patient, and D, contact the healthcare provider. Explanation. Perforation is a risk of gastrointestinal endoscopic procedures. After the procedure, nurses and patients should be vigilant for an unexplained high temperature, even in the absence of abdominal pain. A patient is admitted to the hospital with parotitis. What is parotitis? And who is at risk for the condition? Select all that apply. A. Parotitis is a soft tumor of the parotid gland. B. Patients at risk are those with poor fluid intake. C. Patients at risk are those with a lack of oral care. D. Parotitis is inflammation of the parotid gland. The correct answer is B. Patients at risk are those with poor fluid intake. C. Patients at risk are those with lack of oral care. And D. Parotitis is inflammation of the parotid gland. Explanation. When you say itis, remember inflammation. Parotitis is painful inflammation of the parotid gland. This gland is located between the ear and the jaw. Patients at risk are those with lack of oral care or poor fluid intake. 